Well, good afternoon and welcome to the February Sandhouse meeting. And before uh, we start this program, I just want to make the announcement now and then later, because some people are on now and others come on later. But a month from today, we will have uh, Stefan Loeb, who is the chief commercial officer of Watco Companies and also the vice chairman of the American Short Line and Regional Railroad Association as our speaker. And he's going to be talking about short lines in general, as well as a little bit about Watco. And then in April, we're going to have Mike Nolan, who is the uh, president and chief executive officer of the Northern Indiana, Northwest Indiana Commuter, Northern Indiana Commuter Railroad Transportation District. And he's going to talk about the two construction projects, which total, I think, approximately 1.5 billion in investment in the South Shore Line. But today we're going to be also talking about passenger railroads and in particular Amtrak. And our panel moderator is Dr. Joseph Schofer. Joe is a professor of civil engineering and transportation. And he's also the associated dean for faculty affairs for the McCormick School of Engineering at Northwestern University. And a very good friend of many, many, many people in the transportation industry. So with that, Joe, please carry, take it away. Thank you very much, Norm. I'm really glad to, to be here and to learn more about the Amtrak and passenger rail service. This is certainly a topic of, of contemporary interest. We have a new president who at least used to ride uh, inner city trains, Amtrak. It's a good time and really always a good time to be considering options for and challenges to inner city rail passenger services in, in the United States. And we have a, a, a superior panel presenting to us today, a group of people who are highly qualified to talk on this subject. Uh, the way the drill we're going to follow is I'm going to introduce them quickly and I'm going to tell you that I have a multi-page uh, biography on each of these speakers, which I will read in my leisure. Um, and I will give you only the barest minimum of, of introductory information for, for each, but I can assure you their qualifications are, are, are many and, and varied. Each will, I'm gonna introduce them all at once. Each will speak in turn. Uh, we'll give them a chance to discuss and perhaps uh, argue with each other for a while. And we'll be taking questions from the audience through the Q and A process. And this is something uh, I don't know much about, so we'll all work on that on that together. When we do uh, open it up to questions, remember we're talking about questions, not speeches or statements. Please keep focused on the, the, the topics that our speakers are going to pr present to us. Speaker number one, um, Thomas Cornelli. He's an independent consultant, uh, a passenger rail planner, um, and he will, I'm told, talk from the perspective of, of the, the, the various states. Uh, Tom served as Amtrak's principal officer for infrastructure planning in, in the West. Um, he led the establishment of commuter rail and regional express buses for the Ann Arbor Transportation Authority. Uh, he was a member of the New Starts planning staff for Chicago's uh, Metra commuter rail service. And um, I'm aware of that he publishes significantly on the subject of passenger rail policy. Uh, Jim Matthews is president and CEO of the Rail Passengers Association, the primary advocacy group for that, that um, sector of, of, of travelers. Uh, he'll talk from the policy perspective. Uh, he's a strong advocate of in, in the rail passenger space. And I'm really impressed that he had a long career with one of my favorite magazines, which is Aviation Week and Space Technology. My wife just made me throw out my hundred, uh, my 50 year collection of Aviation Weeks, and it was a heartbreaking experience. Henry Pose Posner is the third, um, is the perpetrator. This uh, session was his idea and he brought this team together. Henry is the, the chairman of the Rail Development Corporation. He'll talk from the perspective of global passenger transportation. Um, RDC has rail operating interests in Europe and Central and South America. RDC Deutschland is the number two intercity operator in Germany, at least it was before uh, pre-COVID. Uh, it still runs the auto shuttle to the resort island of Silt. Henry's also chair of the Iowa Interstate Railroad. He, he held various positions with Conrail and he lectures on uh, rail regulation at a small school called Carnegie Mellon University. Our, our final uh, panelist is Paul Vilter. Paul is Assistant Vice President for Planning and Commercial Services of Amtrak. 
he will, I think, represent the Amtrak perspective. Um, he has held uh, at Amtrak numerous management roles and prior to Amtrak, Paul held marketing and sales positions at Conrail. Um, people, this should be really interesting. I'm getting out of the way and I'm turning it over to Tom. So, well, thank you. And first off, I'd like to extend my thanks to the Transportation Center for the inv invitation to participate. Um, I came to my first Sand House Gang in 2006 when I was a grad student at the University of Illinois. And I always wanted to come and speak uh, before the Sand House Gang. I wish I was there in Evanston at the Transportation Center, but this is fun too. Um, also, I'd like to clarify before I start that the remarks that I'm gonna give here are my own personal opinions and don't represent um, the opinions or statements or positions of any of that of my prior employers. In talking about Amtrak and state corridors, I'd first like to talk specifically about what Amtrak is, as this is often a point of confusion. Amtrak is a service mark for the National Ra Railroad Passenger Corporation, a federal government corporation chartered by Congress with the Passenger Rail Service Act of 1970. The Congressional Research Service describes a federal government corporation as an agency of government established by Congress to provide a market-oriented public service and is intended to produce revenues that meet or approximate its expenditures. Of the 18 federal government corporations created by Congress, Amtrak is arguably the closest that the U.S. has come to creating a crown corporation found in the Commonwealth or something approximating the nationalized firms that were once common in Western Europe. In its creation, Congress granted Amtrak the authority to exercise a bundle of rights normally reserved for the federal government, with the most important being the right to access the general railroad system of transportation. Amtrak has also developed and owns the rights to unique technologies for supporting inner city passenger railroading, along with a half century of ridership and financial data. According to the FRA and the Congressional Research Service, Amtrak has received approximately $52 billion in federal funds since its creation in 1971, up through 2020. That's in year of expenditure dollars. Adjusted for inflation, that amount is $94.3 billion. With that background in mind, I would like to now talk about services sponsored by the states. The Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act of 2008, or PREA, set forth a new definition for state corridors, defining them as services that have 700 and 50 or fewer route miles. Services operated by Amtrak within the Washington, New York, Boston, Northeast corridor were not included in that definition. Let's be specific about what state support means. As a federal government corporation, Amtrak sells access to its bundle of rights and a portion of its capabilities to states, along with train operating services, and reports the payments from states as operating income. I'm gonna get into some numbers now, and I apologize for the complexity, but to understand a complex technical system, which is what Amtrak is, we have to have some data. I provided a slide that's formatted like, like a handout that summarizes the data that I'm going to talk about. And I also give a, a list to all the sources that I used. And that slide is gonna be available after the talk today. In 2021, there are 20 state or regional agencies across 17 states responsible for funding 28 Amtrak routes that together comprise 31% of Amtrak's route mileage. The long distance services comprise 67% of Amtrak's route mileage and the Northeast corridor, the remaining 2%. Comparing fiscal year 2009 with fiscal year 2019 finds that ridership for state corridors increased by 7.3%. However, as a share of Amtrak's total ridership, there was a 5% um, uh, increase from 53% to uh, 47, per, or, or there was a 5%, let me start over. There was a 5% decrease from 53% to 47.5% between FY 2009 and FY 2019. The amount of total revenue, however, increased by 50% from 346 million in 2009 to 806 million in 2019. This increase reflects the impact of the PREA Section 209 mandate to standardize the direct and additive costs that are charged to state-supported services. PREA also standardized methods for levying charges on states based on the Amtrak-owned rolling stock 
used in, provided state, used in providing state supported services. In 2019, capital charges levied on states were $294 million, which was a 983% increase over the $27 million paid by states for the same charges in 2009. It's also important to note that capital charges are not factored into fair box recovery ratio for state supported services. 2021 is Amtrak's 50th anniversary. And it's important in focusing um, a larger question for, uh, about the future of Amtrak and where Amtrak could go. Amtrak and states have had 50 years to try to develop a self-sufficient business model in a competitive transportation market. Instead, over the past decade, TRIA directed Amtrak's self-sufficiency mandate toward extracting ever greater payments from states. Amtrak may have reduced its reliance on federal payments, but it has done so only by shifting the burden to state taxpayers. The ongoing COVID crisis has brought about a new consideration over what role government should play in promoting social and economic equity. Amtrak as a whole, and state-supported services in particular, will come under scrutiny because Amtrak continues to demand ever greater federal support and expects cash-strapped states to pay even more for their services. It's important to keep in mind that state-supported corridors had some significant performance issues before the COVID crisis. Despite the tremendous resources poured into developing state corridors by states and by Amtrak, along with some ridership growth, state corridors had the lowest load factors among all of Amtrak's service. In FY 2019, state-supported services had the lowest average load factor across the system at 41%. The worst performing service in the Amtrak system was the San Joaquin Corridor in California that had a load factor of 27%. By comparison, the Northeast Corridor had an average load factor of 57%, the Acela service 63%, and long distance services at 58%. In fact, the best performing train in terms of load factor was the Capital Limited with a load factor of 67%. As the title of this discussion mentions, there's an opportunity here to win or lose. As the old saying goes, never let a crisis go to waste. There's a real possibility that the ongoing COVID crisis and the following uh, uh, policy crisis that we have before us, will see milk toast proposals for increased funding for Amtrak lost to more pressing needs. In order to get ahead of this crisis, I have two proposals that will push the conversation beyond a dichotomy over whether support for Amtrak is a good idea or a bad idea. Again, we need to think complexly to deal effectively with complex technical systems. First, I propose that Amtrak be reoriented towards supporting the development of a competitive marketplace for inner city passenger rail services. Congress has the ability to do this just as it did when it reoriented Amtrak's focus with PREA. Second, I propose a congressional mandate establishing that all data and intellectual property created by Amtrak be classified as a US government work, a recognition that these resources would not exist but for a half century of operating and capital subsidies provided to Amtrak by Congress. From a wider standpoint, giving Amtrak a new mandate would allow for passenger rail to be considered in the same manner as other services that are purchased by public entities, matching the cost of specific services with specific benefits. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Excellent, thank you very much. Yeah, on, on time and on schedule, just like a passenger railroad ought to be. Uh, next, uh, Jim Matthews. Okay, well, uh, thanks for, for having me. Uh, this is my first time uh, presenting to this group, uh, but uh, this is a, a group whose reputation long precedes it, so I'm very, very honored to be here. Um, I don't have any uh, prepared slides. Uh, I would like to just talk about the environment that, uh, that passenger rail is operating in today for a few minutes, and then to get at uh, some of the, the ideas that, uh, that Thomas just raised, because uh, they're important and they're compelling. Um, first, I let's be clear on where we stand with passenger rail today in the middle of the COVID crisis. Uh, ridership on Amtrak is uh, 
down very, very low. Uh, and public transportation and transit are also down very, very low. Uh, there are people who are looking at this and concluding that maybe they will stay low, that everyone will choose to stay home and never venture out of their house ever again. Uh, I vividly recall a, a conversation involving uh, Ned Lamont, the governor of Connecticut, where he speculated that the, we wouldn't need commuter trains anymore because no one's gonna commute anymore. Um, it, that is a very short-sighted view at where rail stands today. It's important to recognize that 38% of Americans are knowledge workers. In other words, the kinds of folks who can do what we're sitting here doing as a group right now, uh, working productively on a computer with a camera, with a microphone. Um, that's only 38% of the American workforce. The rest have to go wherever it is they work. Uh, so let's not pretend for a moment that there will be no call for uh, transportation of any kind uh, as we go into a recovery. And we will go into a recovery. The second thing to recognize is that mobility of all kinds, whether that's rail, public transportation, transit, or buses, or cars, or airplanes, all contribute to economic growth. And it's not about just the, the fares that are paid. Uh, mobility is an absolute enabler to economic growth. And if we want to come out of this recession, we are going to have to invest in transportation of all kinds as the, the spark to get it going. Uh, I don't think there's really much dispute about that. Um, let's talk for a moment though about uh, where we are here in the next few months. Um, Amtrak uh, had to cut back uh, their long distance service to three times a week. They cut frequencies on state supported routes, cut frequencies on the Northeast corridor, uh, and this was in response to, to COVID. Um, throughout that period of time, the long distance trains, for what it's worth, held up very well. Uh, and uh, even in their reduced state, uh, managed to come close to what would constitute a sellout when you take into account the fact that Amtrak was reducing its, its capacity by 50% in order to maintain social distancing on trains. Um, this is evidence of, of a service that people need and want to use. Uh, people are trying to come back to it even in its reduced state. Uh, where we are right now in Congress is we're moving smartly on a rescue bill. That rescue bill, uh, we are all hoping, will uh, fund Amtrak at $1.541 billion for the remainder of uh, fiscal 21. That will enable the restoration of daily service. That will enable uh, uh, restoration of state supported service that will also help to cover some of the, 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 the deficits that states are facing as they try to restore their services because it's quite true that, that the states are, are reeling uh, when it comes to trying to support their service and the restoration of their service. Um, that will take care of fiscal 21. Uh, but we're also looking at an infrastructure package and uh, it really is going to be infrastructure week at some point, we're told. Uh, so uh, that is going to be a pretty substantial package. We don't know how large yet, uh, but there, even before uh, all of this came down, uh, there were figures floating around of $1 trillion or more. Um, that is serious money. And in isolation, you might conclude that that's entirely too much money to spend uh, after we've already spent a bunch of money trying to get out of the COVID crisis. Uh, but the fact is that this is stimulus. This is how you get an economy back up on its feet. Um, and now I'd like to turn just for a moment to the, the subsidy discussion and the profit discussion. Um, I believe the number was 52 billion uh, over uh, 25 years that Amtrak has received. Uh, and that's true, that's a pretty big number. I certainly couldn't write a check like that. Um, but let's talk about some perspective here. Um, let's go all the way back to 1958, okay? Uh, the aviation industry got $700 million worth of tax support, taxpayer support in 1958. Barge boats got into the act. They got $561 million for canal projects. Um, 
The automakers, the trucking companies got $10.3 billion for the National Highway Program in 1958. So for those of you playing along at home in today's dollars, that's $87 billion with a B for highways. And that's all in one year. And that same period of time, what was rail share? It was, that's easy. It was zero. Uh, instead, rail companies spent $1 billion on maintenance, $232 million on new construction, and they paid $180 million in taxes. Uh, that was the policy environment the passenger rail faced each and every year for about a half century, up until Amtrak was born in 1971. In 1971, uh, we created a public corporation uh, with the intent of taking over passenger service. Uh, and it, it is true that the intent or the hope was that we would see that entity become self-sufficient in some way. But the reality is that it's never going to be self-sufficient. No mode is self-sufficient. And Congress recognized that in 1978. And in 1978, they amended Section 301 of the Rail Passenger Services Act to introduce the term to uh, operated and managed as uh, a for-profit corporation. The idea behind that, if you read the report language uh, that went along with that, that was in the 95th Congress in the second session, um, the report language says that Section 9 amends 301 of the RPSA to conform the law to reality, providing that Amtrak shall be operated and managed as a for-profit corporation. This amendment recognizes that Amtrak is not a for-profit corporation. Uh, so that was in 1978. I'm going to go back to airlines for a moment before I wrap this up. Um, as, uh, as Joe mentioned, I spent uh, a, a lot of my career at Aviation Week in Space Technology, and I covered airlines. Let's talk about the single flight of, a, let's, let's say, a, a U.S. Air uh, airplane from Los Angeles to Baltimore. That single aircraft will interact with 26 air traffic controllers of one sort or another on that flight. Uh, every one of those folks is a federal government employee. Their median income as, as a group is $122,000 a year times 26 controllers for that one flight. Now, I'm not complaining about that one single bit. We have the safest air transport system on the planet. And one of the reasons we have that is because we have invested in a sophisticated air traffic control system. But the point is that whether it's airlines or barge boats or buses or trucks, every single mode is subsidized. And so we have to recognize that when you look at the amount of subsidy given to Amtrak, let's call it roughly $1.9 billion a year in a typical appropriation, Amtrak produces benefits for the United States of anywhere from seven to $10 billion, depending on how you calculate it. That's a pretty good return on investment from where I sit. And so I think that when we start talking about coming out of the COVID crisis and what we wanna do from a policy perspective, we need to recognize that $1.9 billion to produce between seven and $10 billion of economic benefit, that's a pretty good deal. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are doing a great job here. Everybody's staying on schedule. I wish I could get my faculty colleagues to work at this same level. Uh, I want to remind some of the, hundred, the 130 people that are uh, listening that if you have questions, uh, enter them in the Q&A. The Q&A is uh, empty right now, and surely you must have a, a few questions to, to challenge our panelists with. Our third speaker is, is Henry Posner III. Uh, he's going to give us a global perspective. Okay, uh, thanks. And I will put up some, I will put up two PowerPoint slides later on because I know you can read faster than I can talk. But let me just first uh, set some context here. First of all, although I have spent my career in the rail freight industry, uh, at least until recently, uh, I've been an NARP member, now RPA member since 1969. For three years, I commuted from uh, Newark to Philadelphia on Amtrak, which would not have been possible had it not been for Amtrak. And finally, uh, in this most recent year, I achieved um, select status due to my patronage of long distance trains 
Uh, I have made uh, four round trips to the Iowa Interstate Railroad's territory on Amtrak in the last year. So um, although I am a freight guy, uh, my roots are freight, uh, we are now in the passenger business in Germany where interestingly enough, uh, our business, which was basically ended by COVID, before it ended, the scale of the operation was roughly that of the San Joaquins, roughly a million annual passengers, bus connections at both ends, length of haul, roughly uh, the same distance as from uh, Bakersfield to San Francisco. Uh, that being said, you know, we're talking about two completely different uh, businesses here. And I would not want to mislead you as to the substantial differences between the environment in Europe and the times uh, that we face here. Uh, one encouraging thing that we have found, which I think would uh, dovetail with what uh, Jim Matthews said, was that as borders close, what you find is that there's an increased demand for domestic tourism. And I think that will be helpful to Amtrak in the days ahead. Other things that I think are interesting are we are a producer of passenger rolling stock in the UK. And in addition to our business in Germany, which we have repositioned into, uh, this is all post COVID. Among other things, we launched an overnight passenger train between Austria and the vacation destination of Zilt. Uh, an emergency commuter service, which we started last month called the Thunderbird service after the 1960 puppet show. All of these are interesting localized businesses that were put together on short notice in an environment which is completely unlike that of the USA. Nonetheless, I'd like to make the point that there are all kinds of models out there. And as you consider the future of anything, it would be helpful to look beyond our borders to what is possible. And I will stop there and hope that that results in more of the uh, Q and A part. Uh, if we could just put up the PowerPoint very briefly, and again, you can read faster than I can talk. I came up with two exhibits, which I thought would be very interesting. Yep, I am on it. Okay. And like Thomas said, you know, th this stuff will be available afterwards. So if we go to the second slide, uh, what, what I wanted to do was put on one page the diversity of operators who are currently doing commuter rail. Please note that under ownership, roughly half of the operators are owned by public entities and half are owned by private entities. The other interesting thing is the diversity of the private operators. Bombardier, First Group, Herzog, Keolis, you could, you could say they're a private operator, but their main shareholder is the uh, National Railway of France. My only point in putting this up is to show that there is already a toolbox out there in terms of how services can be provided in a diverse uh, bunch of settings. Uh, next slide, please, Don. Okay, so, so this simply makes the point that and I get asked this question all the time. Why can't we have trains like in Europe? Because people go to Europe and they go on vacation and they assume that you can somehow translate this to the USA. Interestingly, the Europeans also say, why can't we have trains like America? But of course, they're talking about freight trains. Uh, the main point of this slide is that there, there is a thin line between what constitutes a commuter service and what constitutes inner city. London to Birmingham, the, the Chiltern operation was basically a London commuter service and a Birmingham service that was linked end to end, just like you can get from Philadelphia to New York by changing trains in Trenton using two commuter railroads and they in fact offer through ticketing. 
And theoretically, you could also go from LA to San Diego riding commuter trains. But last time I checked, there was no true ticketing. So with that, uh, Joan, if we could take the uh, slides off, I'd like to make my final point. And I believe I'm still in my schedule slot, which is that there are all kinds of interesting options in your toolbox out there, but it really depends more on the institutional framework than anything else. And that means politics, access, liability, funding, et cetera. And I'll stop with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. We're really rolling along. Our next and final speaker of the panel is, is Paul Vilter. You're, you're muted. We've been there before. <laughs> Unmuted now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hi. Well, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Um, I always like uh, uh, speaking at the Sandhouse Gang uh, because I'm a Northwestern alum myself. I got my uh, MBA at the Kellogg School at Northwestern and 1989, which is starting to sound like a long time ago, and uh, spent a lot of time hanging around the transportation center uh, while I was there with other people who were involved in transportation studies as part of their as part of their studies. Um, like uh, Henry, I'm also a freight guy at heart. Uh, you heard in introduction, I worked for 10 years at Conrail before coming to Amtrak. Before that, I worked for the uh, for CSX and before that, the predecessor to CSX, the Chessy system. So I've had about a uh, little less than half of my career uh, in the freight railroad side and the second half at Amtrak. So it's been a real pleasure to see both uh, sides of that equation and how the two need to work together for success. Um, 2020 was a rough year. Um, it was a rough year for the world, for the nation, for transportation, for Amtrak. Uh, demand, as has been noted, was way down. Uh, we were down more than 90% at, at points. We uh, uh, had to take a lot of belt tightening actions uh, at Amtrak. Uh, we did uh, some self-help actions where we uh, uh, had separation programs for employees, both voluntary and involuntary. Uh, we reduced uh, long distance train service. The one, most of the daily trains went to tri-weekly. Um, we got great support from the federal government and from our state partners to help us get through that. I mean, think of a business who loses uh, over 90% of its customers almost overnight. Uh, it's been a real challenge for uh, uh, Amtrak and our commuter brethren and others to, to battle through this. Um, we're, uh, we're expecting, though, that uh, 21 will be a good year for Amtrak and beyond. Um, it'll be a lot different. Uh, passenger demand is starting to come back, uh, but not quickly. Um, we're expecting to be down about 70% uh, through FY21 or fiscal year 2021. And when I say that statistic, that's compared to our fiscal year 2019, which is sort of the last normal year. So we expect to still be down 70% of our uh, ridership and revenue this year. Um, Vaccines, we have great hope for that, not only to help our crews stay safe who face the public every day, but also uh, to try to stimulate a return of travel demand. And um, we also, as was mentioned earlier by Jim, uh, are hopeful that the federal government as part of what's being called the Amtrak Res or the uh, American Rescue Package will include some additional funding for Amtrak, which would allow us to recall furloughed employees and resume daily long distance service. And we wish to do that this summer if the uh, funding comes through as part of the American Rescue Act. Um, we think that 2021 presents an alignment uh, of federal uh, government in favor of funding for Amtrak that's almost unprecedented. You've got a very pro Amtrak president, you've got a Democratic Congress who's seems to be interested in stimulative spending. You've got perhaps bipartisan interest in a real infrastructure bill with real money behind it. Um, these things all augur very, very well for Amtrak. Um, but at the same time, the needs of the nation are, are enormous and there are many competing demands for uh, funding and many competing proposals for how to help the economy get back. So part of our 
job at Amtrak and part of my job running the corporate planning department is to try to articulate why Amtrak is a sound investment. Um, one of the key things we're looking for is, is uh, reliable funding. Um, you know, part of what I'm going to talk about here in a moment of the things we'd like to accomplish are long-term uh, projects. And those of you who know the rail industry, which is most people on this call, I'm sure, know that we're an industry of long-lived assets and long projects to put them in place. And as you may know, Amtrak every year has to fight for funding. It's very hard to run a long-term capital-intensive business when every year you don't really know what you're going to get. So we'd like to uh, see a trust fund put in place like most transportation modes so that we can undertake some of these very large generational projects that, uh, that need to get done. So this audience probably is aware of this, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and say it anyway, which is when you think about Amtrak, it's really helpful to think of us as three separate businesses that are all interdependent. Um, one's the Northeast Corridor, picture behind me, of uh, the new portal bridge we hope to uh, be able to build in the next few years with New York in the background. Um, the Northeast Corridor scenario is that Amtrak owns uh, uh, the infrastructure. We maintain it, we dispatch it, we control it, we run the trains on it. And uh, it's sort of a traditional vertically integrated rail operation. And it spins off under normal non-COVID conditions uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue in addition to the cost to operate it. Uh, that does not include capital costs. It does not pay for its capital needs. And that's the thing about the Northeast Corridor. The request and the public interest in the Northeast Corridor is to fund the capital needs, not the operating needs. State supported services that uh, Thomas re re referred to earlier are, are a creature of the law that created Amtrak. They allow states to partner with Amtrak to fund operation of these trains. They're not quite a break even operation for Amtrak. Um, as, as again, as Thomas mentioned, this, the, the economics are governed by law, uh, Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act or PREA, Section 209, defines how we have to treat the states equally in, uh, in these arrangements. And uh, the states pay for the direct operating costs, things like the crews and the fuel and the equipment that's used. And they pay some, but not all of the uh, allocated uh, shared costs of the network that they use. And of course, the long distance uh, network is the third part of Amtrak's business, which uh, is kind of the opposite of the NEC in some respects. We uh, do not have to own or maintain or dispatch the infrastructure. The freight railroads do that. But uh, we do not uh, generate revenue uh, sufficient to cover our direct costs. And so there is a, a need for an operating subsidy. So what would we like to do at Amtrak if we were able to get some of the funding that we were looking for? And our objectives you know, vary by our business. Uh, for the long distance business, as was mentioned before, um, we want to re resume daily operations for routes that were daily uh, before COVID. We want to bring that all back. And we, I want to be sure you know that Amtrak is uh, fully committed to maintaining our long distance network. That was under some question a couple of years ago, and there's a lot of debate about that, but Amtrak has landed in the place where we are committed to continuing our long distance network. And we uh, uh, will be rolling out again, some of my involvement in running the planning group, um, uh, plans to refleet it going forward. Uh, the superliners and Amfleet twos are getting old and they're going to need to be replaced. And that's something we're gonna embark upon. Uh, for the state supported corridors, we would like to do a dramatic expansion of those. We would also like to take a role as, uh, as sort of a partner with the federal government to make it easier to initiate new corridors. Um, it really depends on states now. States have to come up with the capital. States have to come up with the operating funding. We're, going, we're advocating and going to continue advocating for federal role in that to provide significant boost in capital so that we can initiate many routes around the country where uh, we and our state partners think that passenger rail can really help with the transportation mix. So that's a big change there that we're advocating. Happy to talk more about that. And the Northeast Corridor, it's basically we're looking to revitalize many of the capital assets. It's very hard to, to do that on you know the annual funding stream that we get. So we're 
looking to uh, get a boost of funding so that we can tackle some of these generational problems of bridges and tunnels that aren't going to continue to be safe and have the capacity we need if we keep funding them the way we have for the last 50 years. So uh, I will wrap it up at that, I think also just within 10 minutes and uh, look forward to the panel discussion and the Q&A. Excellent, really good. You guys are ter you're terrific at time management and delivering a product. Uh, so I wanna give the opportunity for members of this panel to address each other. So uh, do you have any questions or comments uh, to address to your colleagues? So Jim, I have a question, I guess a comment, a, a, a constructive comment about something that we might disagree on, but also some points where I think we do disagree. And that is um, when you were talking about um, Amtrak and the history of subsidies and you know the subsidies that have been given to other modes over the years and they're significant. I think, and, and this comes from my perspective as a practitioner in the field, I'm not an advocate, but what I would like to see, I think would be helpful for advocacy to move past drawing equivalencies between Amtrak and other transportation modes that have received subsidies because Amtrak is very much a niche service. You know, when you think about the traffic, uh, the volume of traffic that is handled by um, air traffic, commercial, air, you know, passenger, freight, private, so forth, there's a number for that. It's lots, it's huge. Amtrak is nowhere near comparison to that. And trying to draw that comparison, I think, undercuts the um, validity of the argument. But where I think we agree, and I think we, I think we might be able to agree or perhaps identify a way to move forward, is to say that because Amtrak is this weird animal, it's this federal government corporation, that we can pivot to say, okay, just to implement all the stuff that Paul is talking about in terms of having a trust fund for passenger rail, you know, let's now get Congress to have Amtrak open up its books so we can have a transparent look inside Amtrak. That addresses, that's something that you know, the Rail Passenger Association put out a report on um, back in 2018 called Amtrak's Route Accounting. Fatally flawed, misleading, and wrong. There's no doubts about what the conclusions of that report are. And part of why you guys had to release that report is because Amtrak guards its data so closely. And I think a congressional mandate to open have Amtrak open up its books um, and also act to support a market for passenger rail that's not exclusively Amtrak would be a good way of moving forward. So Thomas, I don't think we disagree as much as maybe you think we do. <laughs> um, first of all, the, uh, let's, let's talk about Amtrak as a niche. Of course it is, uh, but it's a very important one. Um, the, the fact is that uh, in 1971, the citizens of this country acting through their elected representatives decided that there was something valuable that needed to continue uh, when it became clear that the for-profit railroads were unable to continue operating passenger service while making a profit. Um, and that remains true today. Uh, the, one of the reasons we have an Amtrak is precisely because it is not profitable. Uh, if, there, if there was profit in uh, serving Cut Bank, Montana, then BNSF would be all over it. So I don't think we would disagree on that. Amtrak exists to step in and provide a vital service where the private sector is unable to provide it in a way that makes economic sense for them. Now, Let's look at the investment, however, and, and let's not even talk about the other modes. I, I'll take your point. Let, let's look at the investment. Um, wherever you put these investments, they tend to return many multiples of the dollars that are spent on them. I'm going to pick on Cutbank just because it's the, I think it's the, the best example of a very small community that benefits. Um, Cutbank, all of the taxpayers who live in, in Cutbank, if you add up everything they pay together, they pay roughly $12,000 a year. That's their share for uh, operating Amtrak. 
uh, and that's their share of paying for the empire builder rolling through town twice a day back before COVID. Um, because that train rolls through Cutbank twice a day, once in each direction, the town of Cutbank benefits to the tune of roughly three hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but for a town of just a few thousand people, that's a pretty big benefit. And when you compare that to the money that's being spent to provide it, it's a many, many multiples of what's being spent. And if you start to look at communities all around the country where these, these services exist, you see the same dynamic at play. You see restaurants that exist because people are getting on and off the train. You see hotels that exist because people are getting on and off the train. You see schools that have students in them from neighboring uh, uh, counties because they can get to and from uh, college or, or school. Um, no matter how you slice it, smaller communities are outsized beneficiaries of this investment that we have made in connecting uh, what people sometimes derisively call flyover country to the opportunities of larger economy. Uh, and so again, we can quantify pretty, pretty clearly and directly that for putting $1.9 billion a year into Amtrak, I get about seven to $10 billion back out in the form of economic benefits to the communities served. Um, let's turn briefly to the, the transparency issue. Um, I don't disagree. Uh, one of the things we asked for uh, when uh, last year, when the uh, Federal Railroad Administration was uh, considering its final action on the rules around metrics and standards for Amtrak, one of the things we advocated for uh, was more transparency. Um, FRA declined to uh, take our suggestion on that score. Uh, but the fact is that um, when I was at Aviation Week, I was able to learn more about the US Air Force budget, uh, including what they were spending on stealth um, than I can in some cases on, on what's going on at Amtrak. And that's not really a knock on Amtrak, that's the system that we have. Um, but the fact is that it could be more transparent. I don't disagree with that. But to what end? Uh, I think a lot of folks want transparency so that they can find a club to beat Amtrak with it. And that doesn't serve anybody. We need to improve rail service in this country. Amtrak is one of several ways to do that. And to the extent that the private sector wants to step in and serve markets where it can identify a, a, an acceptable level of profit, look at Texas Central, for example, that's great. And we support that vigorously. Um, but we can't do that to the exclusion of communities like uh, Cutbank, Montana, or uh, communities in the Gulf Coast, uh, the US Southeast, places that are never going to be profitable to serve, but whose citizens nonetheless deserve that service. Could, could um, I comment uh, on that subject uh, about what the private sector might be capable of doing? Uh, I, I think that there are plenty of models where an inherently unprofitable service can be made less unprofitable if there is some sort of competitive tendering process for the provision of those services. You, know, you, you could argue whether the UK model works or not. Uh, they suffer from having been the first and I think done in a fit of Thatcherite dogma and is probably not the best example. But uh, we just won a tender to operate uh, battery trains in rural markets in Germany. Uh, we hope to make a profit on it, but if we don't, there will be another private sector company which will take the business away from us. And I think if you look at that exhibit, which I put up earlier about the commuter railroads, I actually used that uh, exhibit five years ago, but had to change half the names because in many cases, the private operators were replaced by other private operators. So to the extent we're looking at cut, back, cut bank Montana, and uh, I guess theoretically what you could have is a, a, a bidding process for who would operate the Empire Builder, with Amtrak being the franchising authority and providing two things, one, insurance, and two, access. Uh, I'm not sure what BNSF would think about having a third party operating on their railroad, or more to the point, I'm not sure what Warren Buffett would think about that. But it is a fact 
that BNSF operates passenger trains to places like uh, Aurora, Illinois, which is not a profitable business, but they do it for a subsidy. So I think that there is the potential through the use of competitive tendering to come up with different ways of operating those services in which the competition is who would do it for the lowest subsidy. Thank you. And, so uh, I'll comment as well. Um, those are all good points. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, I'll start with, with Henry, what you were saying about, you know, do the work for the lowest subsidy because, you know, serving Cut Bank, Montana or towns in Minnesota where I grew up, you know, is, is a, a choice that Congress makes to say we want to provide public transportation to these areas that are otherwise unserved. But uh, that type of business is not profitable. If it were, BNSF would be doing it. I know the folks at BNSF and they're great business people and I really like them a lot. And if they could make money at it, they would be doing that. That's, that's why Amtrak exists, is to, as an instrument of the federal government to provide services that the private sector is not providing that Congress thinks are important. Um, but the key is to do it with as little subsidy as possible. And, you know, I came into Amtrak from the private sector, from the freight railroad world. And, you know, the whole emphasis there, of course, is shareholder value and trying to create a return on investment. And, you know, really Amtrak's not that different. The key is just that instead of, you know, striving to maximize profit, you can strive to minimize loss. And it's a lot of the same uh, things that you have to do. And those who followed Amtrak, you know, realized that in 2019 and early, early fiscal 2020, which starts in September 2019, for about the first five months of our fiscal year 2020, before the pandemic hit, Amtrak for a couple of those months as a whole actually was generating revenues in excess of its operating costs. Again, we don't generate enough uh, what you would call profit to pay for our capital needs. We, didn't, we never represent that we we're able to do that. But, you know, the revenues we were running as a net business, including the, um, including the long distance services, were in excess of the operating costs. So Amtrak had spent years and years getting to that point of being efficient enough to uh, basically have exist for a short time, and hopefully we will again, you know, a business that was operating with uh, needs to uh, fund us for capital, but not for operations. Um, you know, the, um, the, the business can be managed, I think, sort of as the way Henry was suggesting is something to minimize the losses and all the same tools, efficiency in, in this, everything where you can think of ways to be efficient is what Amtrak's trying to do. And frankly, has had to do in spades in the last year to deal with our, you know, collapsing revenue. Um, so I, I think that uh, uh, the other thing I would say about the efficiency that Amtrak can bring to a situation like this is our network scope. You know, if you think about, um, well, could someone else do it for less? Um, maybe, uh, maybe not. Because you think about Amtrak, we have uh, a whole network of uh, uh, maintenance facilities. We have a whole network of uh, back office support at our National Operations Center in Wilmington that does crew calling and crew management. We have volume buying. We buy you know, our supplies on a nationwide basis. We have incredibly skilled people in rolling stock engineering and things like that who basically uh, help us to procure modern uh, rolling stock in locomotives and cars that are unique to the American market. If you, um, if you tried to break it up and do these things individually, you'd lose uh, all that uh, synergy that Amtrak brings in terms of our national network. So again, not saying couldn't be looked at, but I'm, I'm going to make some of the arguments in favor of Amtrak. We have become an efficient operator and we have a great installed base of facilities around the country that are, are very useful, not only for running our current network efficiently, but expanding it, as I discussed earlier. Jim, it looks like you're about to say something. Yeah, I wonder if I could just jump in uh, and just add uh, to something that Paul said. There's another part of, of Amtrak's, what Amtrak brings to this dis discussion that I think sometimes is overlooked. 
and that's kind of the institutional capacity. Um, and you know, if you're starting to look at growing corridors and, and adding services and so forth, um, there's a big difference between California and say Indiana with apologies to any Indiana folks I may have on the call here. Um, there are folks who, who are perfectly able to uh, manage a sophisticated operation, to have a sophisticated call for, for uh, proposals and to manage their, their service. And then there are others who, who just are not gonna have that kind of capacity. Um, and so, you know, if you want to be able to stand up this, these additional corridors, depending on where you are in the country, um, Amtrak's probably the best suited to do that um, in the absence of the expertise in, in other places. I'm not saying that's universally true, as I said. Uh, I think that, that there, are, there are certainly plenty of places where the, the state rail plan is robust. They have solid planners on the staff and their DOTs are not just highway departments with a different label on the building. But let's face it, there are plenty of states where that's true. And for those states and for those areas, um, you need that institutional ability to, to pull together a corridor and make it work. So uh, I'd like to put up an example, which I think addresses in a constructive way everything that's been said so far. And, and, and certainly I agree that the network benefits are important. They're probably even more important, by the way, from a marketing perspective, because what we found was in Germany was an isolated operator who's not part of a network will not survive, which is how we migrated to being part of a national bus network until that disappeared. But if you look at the isolated and singular case of BNSF, and again, I, I, uh, I hesitate to speak for BNSF, but it's a fact that they run passenger trains today out of Chicago. It's a fact that they have workshops, rolling stock, et cetera. So what would happen if the state of Illinois said, for the Chicago to Quincy route, we're gonna have a competition and it will be between Amtrak, BNSF, and whoever else might show up. I'm guessing nobody else would show up for a long list of reasons, but the ability to extend a commuter train to Quincy, Illinois, is not that much of a stretch. So I, and, and I think uh, you see a little bit of that going on around the country already in terms of commuter services that slightly start to look like inner city services. And so it is going on in a very low key way. I'd like to pick up on something that Jim said, um, which is, uh, a really good point about how Amtrak uh, helps and works with states and interacts with states around the country. Because as was pointed out, there are about 20 state partners uh, around the country and they have very different capabilities. Um, and you know, working with Amtrak to operate a state supported train is not a sort of a, a binary thing. It's not like we either are doing it without Amtrak or we're doing it with Amtrak. When you think about it, there are I don't know, dozens of aspects to operating a service. You have to provide a crew, you know, engineers, you have to provide conductors, you have to provide onboard service, you have to provide food, you have to maintain the equipment, you have to procure the equipment, you have to uh, have a reservation system, you have to have stations. And the way Amtrak uh, uh, and our state partners work is that it's, it's almost like a menu. There are states who, as Jim pointed out, have tremendous capabilities in-house and have uh, robust and long-standing passenger rail departments. California comes to mind, Illinois, uh, North Carolina, even Maine, uh, and that they um, they basically uh, uh, can do a lot of these things themselves. And when expansions, you know, are considered, they can negotiate with the host railroads themselves. Uh, and so, in that case. Um, Amtrak provides uh, fewer services. We will provide the uh, access to the host railroads, the crews, um, the reservation system. But then on the other end of the spectrum, especially when we're looking to increase the number of corridors around the country, we're approaching states who uh, don't have any uh, staff or capability or familiarity with operating intercity passenger trains because they've never done it. 
And in a case like that, Amtrak is not only doing everything we would do for a, a state, you know, say such as California, but also, you know, planning, marketing, pricing, you know, it, supplying the equipment, uh, cleaning it, maintaining it. And so, uh, you know, Amtrak is really very much a sort of a, a menu of services. And uh, some states have been trying to take over more of the services themselves. Um, you know, years ago, North Carolina got its own equipment and, and contracts for maintenance itself, which is unusual. Most states have Amtrak maintain the equipment, but North Carolina does it another way. And um, so we basically uh, uh, can work with any of these models and do work with any of these models to try to provide the amount of support that's needed to make the inner city passenger uh, network a success. So something with um, Paul, what you, what you were talking about and also um, uh, referring to Henry's businesses in Germany is I, I think the thing to keep in mind is with the European railways is you have the railway packages that came out, which was European commission measures that came out between uh, 2001 and 2016. And there's four railway packages. And what these did was they, they were orders that the, um, to summarize them very simply, that the um, monopoly, the state monopolies, you know, SNCF, Deutsche Bahn, um, Renfa, had to get, find a way to give access to their networks and to their services to new operators. <laughs> and that's how um, Henry's operations in Germany have been able to to work because what you're talking about, yes, you know, Amtrak has this big stack of services and just as Deutsche Bank has a big stack of services and cap capabilities. Because of this legislation, an entrepreneurial operator is has some reasonable confidence that they can go in, assess a market demand, and that they know that the state incumbent is going to, by law, have to interact with them in some way. It might not be perfect, they might be slow rolled, but there is that path in the legislation that's established and that's what we don't have right now with amtrak we have the states but the states are as effective as managing the business of passenger rail as the states are managing other state services you know having agile business having a responsive business isn't something that state governments are known for that's not a surprise to anyone here and to Amtrak, I know that, you know, I appreciate, you know, the idea of the menu pricing and the embrace of that. I've been on both sides of that desk, you know, both in someone on the Amtrak perspective working with states and someone who's a state who's been trying to work with Amtrak. And for the other people who are here on, who don't have that experience, a resource I would point you to is a hearing from the U.S. House of Representatives. And this is one I have linked in my handout. And the the title of that hearing, and this was from 2012, it's a review of Amtrak operations, the high cost of Amtrak's monopoly mentality in commuter rail competitions. And it was specifically going through and documenting the anti-competitive ways that Amtrak was acting when against private operators who were competing with Amtrak for commuter rail contracts. And in reading through that hearings, a lot of that read true to what Amtrak has done to try to prevent private rail operators from getting a foothold in operating inner city passenger rail service in the US. So um, I think right now, when we're at this 50 year turning point, looking at this successful model for liberalization of access and for opening up Amtrak's resources that, this, that the people of the, of the United States have paid for, I think that's a constructive next step toward opening up a, a pathway toward a different future. So, so uh, could I comment on that? And, and I, I think that it, it's important at this point to talk about uh, the markets that we entered in Germany. To be very clear, uh, we did not go out to cannibalize the incumbent national operators. What we did in the case of both freight service in France and night trains in Germany was to try to rescue services that the national operators dumped. And 
while it's true that it's an opportunity to be entrepreneurial, it's also true that being entrepreneurial means that you have the freedom to lose all kinds of money to make somebody else look good. And I would not recommend that. Uh, that being said, the portfolio of businesses that we're in now are the result of trial and error and being pioneers. You never want to be the pioneer. You got to be second or third along, but in uh, most cases, there was nobody else willing to take the task. Uh, Europe is, as I said before, very different. And uh, it may be a question of you be very careful what you ask for, because there are enormous unintended consequences of what happened in Europe, which is not a monolith. I think the way it unfolded in the UK is quite different from what happened in France and what's going on in Germany. So it really uh, needs to be examined at every possible level. Thanks. You've gone quiet and I am concerned that I have a question from Nick Brooks and he's, he's in Brussels. So it's after 11 o'clock at night, and I don't want to keep them up any, any longer than, than we have to. Well, 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 Nick Brooks is a Notre Dame grad, so he's on Indiana time. I was, uh, even, if, even if he's a Notre Dame grad, I would entertain a question from him. I'm not biased in, in, in that sense. But the question I think really goes back, it's going to go to, to you, Henry. Um, he says, is, is um, is it correct to view Amtrak as the solution? After all, over the past 10 years in Europe, brand new competition on the same tracks and long distance passenger rail uh, has driven prices down and service quality up and attracted many new passengers, uh, which has driven down subsidy and been good for the environment. So what's the business model that's working uh, for your competitive services in, in Europe, Henry? I, I think that it is a highly competitive business in which there are just as many opportunities to lose money as there are to make money. And you got your got to feel your way around into it and be prepared to make mistakes and be able to survive them. Uh, I think it's, it's definitely trial and error. Uh, there are probably more failure stories than there are success stories, but at least the lessons in uh, rail freight are that one success pays for 10 failures. So, so you know, we're, we're, we're feeling it, we're, we're making it up as we go in an environment which is both um, relatively new, relatively political, and highly diverse. If you look at how long it took the freight railroads to get used to operating under deregulation, which was in 1980, it took a generation of people to figure out how to do it. But now it's the model for the world. So you got to start somewhere. Are, are your costs lower than the, the publicly operated services? No. Uh, we, 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 we focus on local markets and we focus on providing services that the other people have convinced themselves are hopeless. And it, implicitly from what you said, it doesn't always work. All it has to work is 51% of the time in the long run. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of blending my questions and the questions that I'm getting from the, um, the, the audience. Uh, probably something that goes back to, um, to Jim, and I think Jim, you started to, to ad address this already. So when you, you we, we look at Amtrak or we look at long distance intercity rail service, what's the measure? The measure of the cost isn't straightforward, but we sort of think we know what that means. What's the benefit? Well, the benefit, uh, as I said, is, is, is what you see in the, uh, in the communities served. I'm gonna, let me try and make that a little more concrete. Um, 
So imagine that uh, you take your you take a train to some small community. We won't name it, um, and you're gonna you're gonna spend two nights there. So you get off the train, and you're staying in say an Airbnb. So you go to the Airbnb, and maybe you take an Uber from the station to your Airbnb. You just left some money behind in the economy. Uh, the Airbnb person is going to get a little piece of your money. Uh, later that night, you decide you're going to go and, and go out to dinner. So you've gone to a restaurant in town. And the person who is uh, the waitress or the waiter at that restaurant is, is serving you and lots of other people who arrive by train. That restaurant exists. Let's say it's near the train station and it's got some kind of train theme uh, because of the, the train. Uh, the, the person who, who rents the apartment to the waiter, uh, the reason that that person is able to collect their rent is because that waiter is employed. And that waiter is employed because the restaurant is supported by the folks who get on and off the train. Now, I know that sounds a little facetious, but honestly, if you start to tease these, these threads out, you see this happen all over the country. And when you start to quantify it, you see pretty astounding numbers. Um, the other thing that it does is it takes cars off the road, and we know that cars on the road impose costs on local governments. Um, the, the number one thing that very small town mayors uh, tear their hair out over is paying for their roads, paying for, to, to build them, paying to keep them in good repair, paying to fill the potholes, paying to scrape the roadkill off of them, and dealing with the car wrecks that take place. All of that imposes a cost on the communities. The more those car trips you take off the road, the more you reduce those costs. Um, there's we our model that we use internally in in the association includes 40 variables along those lines that we calculate and we do it on a county by county basis and then roll it up. Um, but when I testified before the U.S. House of Representatives uh, last September, the figure that we used was that the uh, uh, the long distance network alone, just the national network trains, contributes something on the order of five to five and a half billion dollars a year in economic benefits to the community served. Now, when you can set that next to what we spend to have a national network, uh, the payoff is, is pretty clear. Jim, if I could just pick up on, on your point, uh, I, I think you may actually have understated the economic value of having. Amtrak presence in communities. There, there are communities, you know, the smaller they are, the more important Amtrak is to them. And I'm thinking of uh, places like Williston, North Dakota, which is defined by the oil boom coming out of nowhere and the fact that freight rail and passenger rail was available to meet those needs from the get-go. And I'm more familiar with Huntington, Pennsylvania because I'm affiliated now with East Broadtop and Huntington's tourism and college market is certainly defined by Amtrak. But I think that there is a value which you actually, you can actually monetize that of having a rail alternative, even if it's not used. And that is the uh, the light rail line in Detroit. So the Q line cost, as I understand it, three hundred million dollars, and they move about fifteen hundred people a day. And the people who build it consider it a success because even if the trains are empty, they've made the buildings worthwhile, which to me suggests that there is a strategic value to having alternatives, just in case. Matter of fact, the Iowa Interstate Railroad was formed by customers who wanted to see our abandoned railroad restored. Some of them never used us. All they wanted was for the railroad to be there and that was valuable to them. Yes, Those are great examples, Henry. And there's also, you know, very difficult things to quantify. Uh, you know, what is the environmental benefit of having people choosing to ride high quality corridor train service rather than driving. You know, we can estimate that and we do. Um, what is the uh, uh, value of fewer people driving and having fewer accidents? You know, it's, we have statistics from the federal government that attempt to quantify that. It's safer 
to get cars off the road. A lot of the states who partner with us to support passenger rail service, they do it because they believe it's good economically. In a lot of cases, it's not only all the benefits you just suggested, but often it's less expensive than an alternative, which is usually building more lanes on highways. And it's very expensive now. Most of the interstate network is built out with about as many lanes as you're probably going to be able to fit in urban areas. And if you can move passengers through increased use of rail, as opposed to trying to figure out how to build another lane on the interstate, um, you know, state DOTs look at this. That's not a pipe dream. That's what they tell us. Like, we want to support the train so we don't have to build another lane on the highway. And so there, and the one other sort of going back to the other end of it, as far as things that are hard to quantify is mobility. You know, not everybody has a car or wants to drive a car. Air service and unfortunately inner city bus service is really dwindling in, the, in a lot of the areas of the country outside the urban areas. And, you know, it's hard to put a price on people being stuck basically, but Amtrak provides a way to help move people. But well, well, it, it does. Well, it, it, Sorry, go ahead, please. It, it, it does. And I think an important point there, Paul, I kind of wish that Amtrak would, would talk a little more publicly about um, the, the degree to which uh, your traffic consists of seniors, elderly, disabled. I've seen figures for disabled passengers on Amtrak approaching 26% on the long distance services. That's an enormous number. And when you think about it, um, I always use the sort of the, the, the stereotypical example of grandma in her powered wheelchair with her supplemental oxygen. Well, she can't fly and she certainly can't take a bus with all that stuff and it's not safe for her to drive. So how does she get around? How does she get to her, her medical appointments? Very often Amtrak is the answer, uh, particularly in some of these small, you know, go to a place like Marks, Mississippi, right? That's how grandma gets around. Um, and so uh, how do you put a price on that? Well, uh, I'm not certain, but we can certainly put a value on that. Whether it's profitable or not is beside the point. Grandma deserves to be able to get safely to her medical appointments. And if Amtrak's the way to do that, then it's good that we provide it. So one thing I'll say to that, I think you're kind of, on, by focusing on those, you know, what you're talking about globally, when you talk about the economic impact of services in Montana along the High Line, on the Empire Builder. And you talk about specific niche groups um, that use the service. I think that's the conversation we should be having. But I think that the way to get that conversation is to have Amtrak release its data. Because right now, the conversation that we have is only with the data that Amtrak chooses to release and only with the pre analysis or, or the redactions or the summarization that Amtrak chooses to put out there. So we're at, we're at Amtrak's mercy. And if we had this data transparency, we could go and we could find, okay, what are places where these niches could be developed further, where there might not be a lost cause? Because when we listen about long distance trains and something that you've been fighting for, Jim, for a long time, and your group, for a long time across various administrations, is how much Amtrak says that the long distance trains lose money. And your analyses and analyses from NARP beforehand and from independent journalists beforehand have shown that it's an allocation issue. And it's about how these system level costs are allocated. If we have the transparency, we could get through to that. And we could see that, hey, these services actually, you know, don't function as nearly as bad as we thought they did. And perhaps with some different direction, they could do better. But on the state corridors, there's a problem because the costs are broken out and we can see, for example, at like the San Joaquin service, it's a wonderful service, you know, fantastic equipment, very nice onboard service, very fast. The load factors is 28%. So almost 75% of that train is going unsold. And that's an FY 2019 number. FY 2019 was a pretty good travel year. The Capital Corridor has rarely broken above 33% in its almost 30 year existence of a load factor. So with these tra at, at some point, you know, that impact, there is a question of, there's a reality check that comes in as to how much of that economic impact is justified when you have costs for significantly large corridors, especially when you're going to have other transit modes, you know, local transit, you know, large cities, small cities that are going to say, because of COVID, we need to have this relief because we're providing service that no one, that 
people who have no other option rely on. So if, if I could just uh, piggyback on Thomas's point, I think that the, the subject of cost allocation is not science, it's art. And so in a constructive way, let me just, uh, there are a couple books I want to recommend. This is a book that most of you are probably not aware of, A Railroad Manifesto by Tom Erickson, colleague of mine from the Rock Island days and Conrail days, talks about how it is in some cases true and in some cases false, how fixed costs are allocated. It makes for very interesting reading and it applies probably equally to passenger services as well as freight. So for those of you who are looking for your next book to read, and by the way, Tom's a Northwestern grad, uh, I, I would put that right at the tippy top of your list. Okay, so I'm uh, under orders to finish in, in three minutes. Um, and so I'm gonna pitch one question to you that's a little bit orthogonal to this discussion. Automation, automation, uh, self-driving cars, self-driving everything. What's how does that going to affect the future of inner city rail transportation, both in terms of competition and in terms of bringing that technology into the railroad industry? Well, I'll start with one perspective on that, and that's something that we're focusing on at Amtrak is how to get passengers to and from the train station to where they're actually coming from and where they're actually going to. Um, you know, one of the real difficulties we think we have in penetrating new markets is that folks don't want to go from a train station to a train station. They're almost always going, you know, from say their home to a hotel for a business meeting or from a friend's house to another friend's house. And so we really need to figure out a way to help people understand their options about how to get from where they really want to go to where they really want to go. And if, uh, automated vehicles could provide a way to move people to and from train stations, which can serve as a gathering point, and then the train moves to the other end of the destination, and then people are dispersed to the automated vehicles. I think that helps Amtrak. Now, of course, that begs the logical question, well, why don't people just stay in their automated vehicle and go the whole way, and you don't need the train anymore? And, you know, that's something that the railroad industry dealt with 100 years ago when they originally supported the good roads movement because they thought wouldn't it be nice to cancel all the money losing local trains and have automobiles bring people to the main line and we'll run the long distance trains and make money at that but of course people started driving the whole way so it's really unknown right now would that be a net plus or net minus but you know the technology is coming and it's, it's incumbent on amtrak to figure out a way to embrace it and try to make it a positive for us I think from our perspective at the association, we would view it, um, we think the first mile, last mile uh, part of the equation makes perfect sense. Um, but when you start getting beyond that, uh, congestion is still congestion, whether the driver is a robot or a person. Sprawl is still sprawl, and it's still enabled by having cars and a car-dependent society. So, you know, we really have to think about whether it would be good for the country and good for our society as a whole. And I, I've never been a fan of uh, the idea of, of self-driving vehicles replacing rail uh, or replacing any other mode for that matter uh, beyond that sort of first mile, last mile part of the equation because it doesn't solve all of the other problems that cars and individual vehicles bring. Okay. Final comment from anybody in the panel? Uh, I, I, I'll just say I agree with Paul but everything he said and simply add that for the leisure market, autonomous vehicles are probably gonna be less important than for the business market. And fortunately, Amtrak is well positioned for leisure. And the other is that autonomous vehicles are a long way off. And anybody who's planning on building a business around autonomous vehicles in the next five years uh, is probably guilty of being highly entrepreneurial. Okay, on that note, I want to thank each and each of you. Uh, Henry, was your idea? I think it was a good idea. I don't think you guys are done. We might want to bring this team back together for another conversation. Uh, and I thank you, Jim, for, for your perspectives. Paul, good to see you and ha happy to have you with us. 
and Thomas, you you as well. So it's a good team, interesting subject. Uh, I've asked, uh, Thomas, you had a, a, a handout that you wanted to deliver. I have no idea how to deliver it, but make send it into uh, send it to Brett if you can do it. We'll we'll make it his problem. I have Thomas's handout, and I am happy to email that out to the listserv. So there it's solved. Well, thank thank you very much, Joan. Norm, it's over to you. Thank you, Joe. And I totally agree that I think we should reconvene at some point because having 134 people either ties or breaks the record for the Sandhouse's largest group. I think we were very close to when we discussed CN's acquisition of the ej and &E. So again, thank you to the panel members. It was very, very good. Thank you, Joe, for moderating. And again, I would like to repeat that one month from today, we're going to have Stefan Loeb speaking on, on short line railroads. Stefan is the chief commercial officer at the Watco companies and the vice chairman of the Short Line and Regional Railroad Association. And then in April, Mike Nolan from the South Shore Line is going to be talking about their two construction projects. One is a brand new railroad and the other is double tracking the main line between Gary and Michigan City. And with that, we will adjourn this meeting and look forward to seeing many of you in on March 23rd. And I forget what time it is, but Joan will be sending out the announcements. And thank, thank you, me. Joan. You made it work. Thanks very much. Thank you, Joan and Brett. And thank Brett. you, everyone. Okay. Take care. See you. Bye.